Divine Truth. Name of this presentation is Love Has Power Over Evil. And it is part of the Lessons in Love series. It was presented in Dallas, Texas, USA on the 19th of February 2012. This is session one, part three. Did you guys here in Texas have any uh, ice storms this year? Like, like hurricanes? Ice, ice, uh, ice storms. Ice. Like, oh, ice. Because ice. Yeah. one of the times I was here, I remember it was minus 20 Fahrenheit or something. And yeah. That was only like, that was five years ago. It was the time before last I came. Five years ago. <laughs> yeah. It was cold. Most people overseas have no idea that Texas can get so cold. Because <laughs> so, every time we think of Texas in Australia, we think of, you know, the cowboys on there driving along in, in the heat, you know, in the dust. And, yeah. Uh, I suppose you'd call them cowboys, yeah. They, they don't uh, wear exactly the same garb as your cowboys. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, there's a lot of uh, guys who uh, on horseback who muster cattle and so forth, yeah. Uh, less so now, they mainly use motorcycles now. And, so <laughs> and there's still quite a lot of them around. Yeah. Okay, is everyone settled? Yep. All right. How did you go with this question last night? Did you get any time to uh, have a think about it? Yeah? Okay. That's good. Now, um, what we, so that the, the object now was to look at the areas where if we love ourselves, how it would affect this psychology of evil. Because remember, it's really the psychology of evil that guides the planet at the moment. And, and you can see from our previous discussion that the psychology of evil actually does, is a lot of times in ourselves too, still. We still have some of those tendencies towards that kind of thinking. And there are many, many people in the spirit world, who in the hells of the spirit world, who are dedicated to that kind of thinking. Their, their whole life is dedicated to continuance of that kind of thinking as well. And so what we need to do to break the cycle is to break the cycle of the psychology of evil, break the cycle of our belief systems that cause us to have a tendency towards evil. Now, God created us, and it's very important to understand this, that God created us with the ability to overcome evil. God did not create us with an inherent feeling that we were always going to be evil, he never created us with a flaw. He created us perfect. Now, because God created us perfect, any time that we justify evil as saying that it's because of the flaw that God created, we are really well out of line or out of harmony with love in that place. Now, can you see already that many religions automatically say that? So automatically there's a disharmony with love. And in fact, it also, this whole idea that we were created with flaws or we were created sinners, as the terminology is often given, the whole idea that we were created sinners is itself a terrible blight on the truth about God. Because we're basically saying that God couldn't create us perfect God had to put in some flaws or was so limited God designed flaws inside of us as humanity and nothing could be further from the truth actually it, it is an underlying problem to believe now there are many million, billions in fact of spirits in the spirit world in the first dimension of the spirit world in the hells who still believe in this concept 
that they were created with a flaw that they couldn't overcome all of their life. And they arrive in the spirit world with so much anger towards God because of the flaw. Not understanding that God never created us with flaws and flaws entered us through a different process. Through, through a different process other than God creating them. So we need to start with this basic understanding that we have the ability to be perfect. In the first century I said you must become perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. We have the complete ability to become perfected in every aspect of our being. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, every aspect of our being, we have the ability to become perfect. If we remember that, every time we see a flaw, we won't go, oh, I'm just going to accept this flaw. <coughs> we will start to look at, well, I can release this flaw. I can get rid of this flaw if I do something about it. The problem with believing that we're created with flaws is... There's this almost instant helplessness that happens. We instantly feel that it's a hopeless situation for us to ever achieve a better condition than what we're currently in. And because many people on the planet believe this, they make no personal attempt to better themselves. They make no personal attempt to remove their own flaws. You understand? And it's a terrible, terrible concept. To, for us to continue believing that we need to have flaws of any kind. Yep. God created us perfect physically, emotionally, spiritually, and we have the ability to be perfect while we're living on earth. We don't have to become a spirit to become perfect. We have the ability to be perfect while we're living here. Right? We just need to be truthful about the flaws. We need to stop judging them see them for what they are, identify them, and hopefully the previous discussion helped in that process. And then we want to see what would love do so that we can see, all right, this is what love does, this is what love wouldn't do. Now, in every discussion where I talk about what love does, I need to remind you of one basic principle, and that is this. Doing comes from feeling. Now what I mean by that is, whenever we go and do something, we are actually being driven by a feeling that causes us to do that thing. That feeling within us triggers a thought within our brain and the two things combine to cause us to generate desire. And once desire is generated, then we'll go from thinking and feeling something into actually doing it. Do you understand? The reverse is also true. And that is... It is impossible to overcome a doing, in other words, impossible to overcome an action, unless you feel the cause of that action. You see, many people in almost all forms of spiritual development say to you that you can do it before you feel it. They say to you that you, you can actually act in harmony with love without actually feeling in harmony with love. And as a result of that, many of us, what we attempt to do is we try to act differently without feeling the reason why we, are, we have acted the way we've acted. So we try to act differently. Now, can I just say something else? I think Mary said... What was it, Ray? Trying is lying. Trying is lying. <laughs> and what she means by that is that when we try to actually take the doing action, the, we try to act differently, without actually feeling why we act the way we act, we are actually lying to ourselves. We're trying to falsify or put on a facade of what we really feel. Right? To, to actually change 
our heart needs to change. Remember I said to you yesterday, if your heart doesn't change, you can, in a nice, relaxed situation, you can think, oh, I'm going to do this. But when you put yourself under pressure or some pressure comes to you, often your actions are very different. And the reason why they're different under pressure is because the feeling is still inside. So, for example, if we looked at all of that list of e the creation of evil, like we looked at the one, what was it, the one that I mentioned was um, others denying our demands, for example. So if we look at that as a creative evil where we see when other people deny what I demand, I get angry and upset, and then eventually I could even go worse than that, you know? Now, if I see that as something within myself, the fact that I demand things from others, I can try to no longer demand things from others. Good luck with that. <laughs> right? Because after a while what will happen, you'll try, you'll try, and then after a while some stressful situation will come up which triggers some fear within you or something like that, and then what will happen is that all the trying in the world goes out the window and you're back doing exactly the same thing you were doing before with the, in, under the same circumstance or situation. So we need to give up this concept that we can actually do something without actually changing a feeling within us. We have to actually change the feelings within us. And that often means changing the releasing from us the opposite feeling. So if I have a feeling that I can demand something from Mary, then I have to allow myself to go through this emotionally and go, OK, yes, I believe I can demand it, why do I feel I can? And I have to get deeper into it and allow myself to see why I demand it and what the underlying emotion is inside of myself that I need to feel. And once I release this underlying emotion that causes me to believe I can demand something of Mary, then I'll no longer believe that I can demand it. Does that make sense to everyone? If I try to no longer demand anything from Mary, while at the same time... I never change the emotion that I believe I should be able to, then I am still at some point in the future going to be demanding towards Mary. It doesn't matter how much I try, I'll sooner or later do something that shows my demand. So we need to have this concept, whenever we discuss anything about love of self, to correct an issue, we need to have the concept to, to actually correct, we need to feel it rather than just think it. We need to stop thinking that we can think our way out of a situation and actually start to see that all of our thoughts come from these deeply held emotional beliefs which, while they're with us, will draw us into the situation anyway. They'll even draw us into the situation through the law of attraction. We'll keep attracting events that we believe we've overcome right? when we're doing it with our mind. And the reason why we're keeping on attracting the event is because nothing's really changed in the soul. Nothing's changed in terms of the emotion that's within it. So it's very important to understand that. So using that as a basis, what did you come up with? In terms of how can love of self... What would you do if you loved yourself? What, what are some of the things you would do? Ideas? So we go Marissa and then... Marina? Marina, sorry. And then to Jen. Uh, I would say love of self is not catering to anyone's addictions. Yeah, see, I, I would call that love of others. Oh, okay. What would it be if it was love of self? Not caring to my own addictions? Ah, yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? How really good. To my own addictions. You can see, you can see by saying it the other way, <laughs> we're really blaming others for our actions towards them. Saying it this way, we're now seeing the ownership is on me yeah, to address my own addictions. Once I release my own addictions, I'm not going to be able to respond to any of yours. Right, you're taking responsibility, personal responsibility exactly. for all of that. Right? Exactly. So it's very good. That's an act of love to do that. I agree. Yep. Anything else? Uh, oh, Jennifer was going to be next. Okay. Um, the willingness to feel the root cause of, of what's driving that behavior. So should we call that the willingness? Well, I would actually 
The desire? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll make it more positive than that. Let's make it the desire to feel all, let's put it as all, yeah. of my own emotions. Yeah? All of them. So um, can we all. put up there at the root cause? Because for, for me, that's really a key thing. I had to keep going deeper. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can feel my frustration. That's feeling my emotion. But it's what's underneath and causing the frustration where I've actually been able to work through stuff. But you won't get deeper unless you feel your frustration. That's true. So, yeah. So if I just blanket it to all, okay. if we start with, if we're frustrated, feel mm -hmm. your frustration. Yeah. You don't have to act upon it. Feel it. Right. When you feel your frustration, you feel why you're frustrated. Then feel that. <laughs> Does that make sense? So yeah. everything needs to be a feeling, and we can we can drill down into our feelings by just feeling the one above. So we don't have to be all clever about it intellectually. We just need to start with the feeling that we feel, and then allow ourselves to drill into the feeling and feel the feeling properly, and then we'll always get to the next feeling. Telling the truth. Telling the truth. Um, Telling the truth about what's going on inside me. Well, there's two parts if we love ourselves. There's telling the truth to ourselves. Right. But it's very hard. Very hard. Yeah. And to others about ourselves. About ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's really hard to. Now, again, is the truth what we want to believe about ourselves, or is the truth what we really feel about ourselves? Yes, yes. Can you see the difference? It has to be based on our feelings about ourselves, right? Not, not anything else. Yes? Any other ideas that you come up with? Trusting our intuition. Trusting intuition? How, does that, uh, how is that a love of self? That trusting those feelings. So trusting your feelings? Mm. And what if your feelings are out of harmony with love? Would you still trust them? Mm. Can we? Uh, we need a tighter definition, I think. Okay. That's what I'm suggesting. So yes, we do need to come to trust our own feelings. But the problem with trusting our own feelings is sometimes some of our feelings are going to be out of harmony with love. Can we really trust them? Probably not. So what do we do? What, how do we determine? what we can trust? That's the, that's the question that we need to ask ourselves. Yeah. Um, what's been really helpful to me is building my relationship with God, because God knows the truth. And I start to feel that more accurately as I develop that relationship. Yes, but uh, we're focusing here on love of self rather well, than love of God. Well, that's the most loving thing I can do for myself is to develop that relationship, I feel. How do you develop a relationship that initially you don't even know exists? And Pray. <laughs> well, this is what I'm suggesting, is that there are things that all mankind can do, whether they believe in God or not, which, which will be a part of this. And it doesn't matter whether God's involved or not, they can still become more loving of themselves. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. what, what I would like to include in this list is all the things about like, loving ourselves that don't necessarily relate to God at this point. Is that okay? And the reason why I want to do that is because you'll see, perhaps, well, you won't probably see later in this conversation, unfortunately, but anyway. Um, come to like or love my love of attraction. So what's that really, Katarina, when you love what your soul attracts? Humility. Isn't it just really loving your own soul and, and what it's able to create? Okay. It, everything it's able to create, not just, not just its law of attraction with regard to what it creates negatively, but also its law of attraction with what it creates positively. Right. Yeah. So, so you're suggesting that if I love my law of attraction, I'm loving myself. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. Yep. Okay. So if I love myself, I love my attractions. Now the only problem with that, um, can you see some flaws with this? We need to have a tighter definition. Because um, what, 
what if I attract uh, 50 women who want to have sex with me? And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so am I in harmony with love? Too? No, but not loving, not loving to do that, but to actually understand that I attracted it. So that it was me that attracted it. Okay, so you're not suggesting we act upon... No, I'm suggesting that attract. to recognize that something within me drew this toward me and I should not go, you people did this, but... Yeah, but can you see, if, I, if I'm a man who likes to have sex a lot uh, with different women, then I'm going to think, my law of attraction is pretty good with 50 women want to make love to me. But I'm, is it loving, though? So well, see, this is where we need to refine the, okay. <laughs> the idea, yeah. you see? So it's, I'm not going to just love my law of attraction. True love itself is not just about loving your law of attraction. Yes. Because it, it's got to be in the right direction, doesn't it? You've got to be attracting things in the right direction. Right? So, so there's got, got to be more involved here with this particular issue. Yeah? Can you see that? Not convinced? No, not, not convinced. I'm trying to, to understand. See where I'm coming from? Yeah. The direction, actually. Because yeah. I'm finding that I'm selective with my law of attraction. I don't like the bad stuff. I get upset first when bad stuff comes. and I'm, So that's uh, unloving to me to not see that it's me that created it. I agree. But uh, the average person in the hills feels exactly the same way. Okay. Do you understand? Yeah. They, they don't like what they've attracted. That's negative, And they love what they attract that they feel is positive. And they do attract things that they feel are positive. Like they attract, for instance, if you're a man who's raped a woman on earth, you pass over in the spirit world, you often attract women who are terrified of men raping them in the spirit world. And they love that. So they're loving their law of attraction. But, but is it helpful for their getting out of evil? No. So is it really that we love, begin to love the truth and love the laws that bring us truth about our soul? Uh, but again, whose definition of truth? You see, if it's my definition of truth, then that would be very different than God's definition of the truth and other people's definition of the truth. So I've, I've got to... There's got to be some kind of tighter definition in terms of what is loving than these things. Pain. I agree Does... that when you love yourself, you will love what your soul attracts. I agree with that but you won't necessarily love it in the sense of act upon it and all those kind of things. And this is where if I write down I love my law of attraction, everyone's going to then go and think, oh, well, you know, I've attracted 50 women and made love to you, so I should go and make love to 50 women. That would be great. And, and that would be degrading their soul in that phrase. And then they'd say, oh, yeah, but Jesus told me that I'm allowed to do that. So let's just rub that off for a second. <laughs> you want to come up with some other <laughs> closer definition. Yeah? If you love yourself, would you open to um, open to discovery, open to explore? Would that be loving yourself by loving your life here on Earth? Could I define that as if you love yourself, you'd love what you desire, or you love your mm, desires? I guess what does and, this, and then yeah. I'd go down the same track. Well, some of our desires are quite are negative. Quite negative but, right. And if we love them, then love it's going to lead us a long way down the wrong path. And, and that's what most of the world is probably doing at the moment, is going down the wrong path with regard to many of their desires. So, mm, can you see it? It's yeah. a bit hard, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. Sorry? I just wait for the mic. Would what you're say, saying be true if you said to, to honour and follow your loving desires? Yeah, but see, again, it depends on what I define as love. If oh, I define okay. love as, you know, love is, uh, love is uh, having sex every day with a different woman, then, then I mm -hmm. basically am going to probably do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's loving. I have actually met men in spiritual circles who only go to spiritual meetings so they can hook up with women. And they have a long stream of women as a result because there's many women who feel that, oh, meeting a spiritual man, meeting a spiritual man, and they go along to these groups. And, and, I, and I knew a few of them in Australia who, who told me that their only reason for going to these spiritual groups was so that they could hook up with the women who were there. I remember one time we talked about... Um that if you follow your passions and desires, even if you're not sure that they're loving, mm -hmm. then see what happens. If it's a positive result, then it's more likely to be loving. And if it 
turns out destructive, then it's obviously not, and to investigate and explore. Well, I agree with that statement, and I've made it. Mm -hmm. However, I would also clarify it further by saying, well, sometimes I think it's a positive result when it's right. not, and uh, sometimes I think it isn't a positive result when it is. So, so, and it's got to be real love that changes evil, not, not what I believe love to be. So, mm -hmm. so while I agree that the way to discover your passions and desires is to follow them and see where they take you and see what mm -hmm. corrections the universe brings to you through the law of attraction, I don't agree that that's necessarily like truly loving yourself. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, in the sense that to truly love ourselves, our passions and desires have to be always... If I love myself completely, so this is what we're talking about here, if we yeah. completely loved ourselves, not, not if we're, we're attempting to, but if we really did love ourselves in all aspects, what would we be doing? Honouring our loving passions and desires. <laughs> Honouring our loving passions and desires, I agree, uh, but who defines the loving? Not me. Can you clarify that so that it's... Well, God has to define the loving. Uh-huh. Something external to myself has to define the loving. Right. Mary, you wanted to say anything? We'll so to, to me, it's still it's about pain. The way that God shows me that I'm, it's, it's becoming sensitive to my pain. Yes. Now, now we're starting to get a bit more. It's very, very important to see this. Remember, in the previous list of all the evil. Most of our evil comes from our pains. It comes from the pain that's within us, the pain or the potential of pain, the, th the threat of pain against us. So, so if I truly love myself, what would I do with my pain? I would choose to feel all of my own pain. Right? It's not just that. Also, the law of attraction can only correct me if I'm willing to be sensitive to the pain that I, I might be getting an addiction, met, but there will be a pain in my soul if I'm in addiction, won't it? So if I'm sensitive to that, then I can then I can trust the law of attraction. But when I'm, I have to want my pain. I have to want it. Yeah, which is a desire yeah. to feel all of your own emotions, including your pain. Yeah. 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 Minute by minute. Yeah. yeah. What happens when you feel your own pain? It hurts for a start, doesn't it? And then, and then, what what do you find yourself doing when you feel your own pain? Do you find yourself becoming less sensitive or more sensitive more to sensitive. other people's pain? More, 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 sensitive. more sensitive. So, if I felt my own pain of being spanked as a child when by by dad, and then I've got I'm a dad and I'm spanking my child, I'd be going, well, I think I've got to think about this a bit more, wouldn't I? If I was feeling my own pain, truly, I would, I would have to really, that would cause me to pause in that particular interaction. But if I'm desensitised to my own pain and I feel, well, and my justified to myself my, that my dad was just causing me that pain, then, then I won't be sensitive to it at all. I'll just bash away, you know, till I've got a red, red bottom and say, there, you deserve that. And that's, that's my desensitivity to my own pain of what happened to me when I was a child, coming out with regard to the reflection of, the other, of my child. So, so can you see, we need to have a desire to feel all of my own emotions, including my own pain. But if I could just add to that, when I love myself, when I feel my own pain, I no longer justify pain. The pro a problem that most of us have with regard to the creation of evil is that we have a tendency to justify pain. Because to create pain in another person, we have to be justifying something. And we are justifying the creation of pain in the other person 
because we believe that we have pain and so they should have a similar amount of pain than what we have. Now, if you think, uh, let's say your child was murdered, you would have probably a great deal, if you love the child, you would have a great deal of pain associated with that murder. Yes? Now, if I feel my own pain, I would never justify murdering someone else's child as a compensation for my own pain. Right? The murderer is somebody else's child. Do you get that? They're an adult now, but they're somebody else's child. You see? I would never justify murdering the murderer so that my pain goes away. If I feel my own pain, I'd be going, it's terrible to have your child die. Terrible. Right? It's a terrible feeling that I had to go through to have my child die. It's a terrible feeling. How can I then go and create exactly that same feeling for another person if I was sensitive to the pain that was within me about that subject? By becoming more sensitive to my own pain about the particular thing that happened, I am actually helping the situation because I am now not going to take the same action to harm another person if I truly feel the pain that's within myself. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? Is my example okay? Yeah? Yeah? Get that? Okay. So we've talked about catering to addictions. Can I add the, in the addictions area, can I just add the word demands as well? And can I add the word expectations as well? Desire to feel all of my own emotions, even pain, can I add to the end, end of that? Is that okay? No. Telling the truth to ourselves and to others about ourselves, very, very important. And to others about ourselves, very important. When I feel my own pain, I know to justify pain, so I need to, it, this is relating to this one here, a desire to feel my own pain will mean that I no longer justify pain at all on the planet. I won't even justify it. So when I see a mother screaming at her children, I won't justify it. doesn't matter why a mum's screaming at her children. Yes, the child might have just wrecked the lolly aisle in the supermarket, but it's still not a justification for mum screaming at it. No? There has to be some other form of control that is able, or some other form of correction that is able to be given. If we call it correction, that's what I, what I feel needs to be given. There needs to be some other form of correction than just yelling and screaming at the child with all this rage. What is the mum avoiding? Her own pain of probably embarrassment right? by yelling and screaming at the child. So not realising that she's probably embarrassing herself even further in, in the moment. <coughs> Um, somebody else there hand um, I think I I came up with something to answer the, the previous concern I had about uh, where you said that well how will we know if it's loving yep. um, if I loved myself I would grow in my desire to know what love is I agree totally with that yes totally. Yeah. so can I say when I love myself, I want what is only loving for myself. Yeah. And, and it'll, we will have to at some point go on our own definition of what is loving. Right? Because, it, because it, using, this, using my underlying reasoning at the beginning, I'm not involving God at this point very much, so we have to start with choosing the underlying definition. So, so how can we determine what is loving for myself? Because from because a lot of painful events can actually be loving. So how do I determine what is loving for myself? It's hard for me to leave God out of this because that's where I go. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> what feedback system does God give you to demonstrate to you whether something's loving or not? There's a law of attraction, yes, but the law of attraction just brings you events. Sometimes your desires are involved in your law of attraction, sometimes the events are very negative, but you think they're great. Pain or suffering, so pain or suffering is an indication of...
Now, to whom? Ah, you see, to myself or others. Now, it has to be real pain or suffering, not imagined. In other words, you know, I no longer am doing what mum wants and she feels terrible because of it. That's not included in this list. It has to be real pain or suffering. Somebody obviously is going through a lot of pain because of an action that I took. Uh, and when I look at it honestly, I can see that, yes, I was probably pretty unloving with taking that action. So this will help tighten the definition a bit, wouldn't it, as to how we can get the feedback happening with the law of attraction. So the effect of something... So, so for example, if you're driving down the road, you, have a, you, you, know, you hit a patch of ice, you fly across the road, and it's a single-laned highway, fly across the road, into the path of the oncoming car, head on, and you kill every person in the car, but you stay alive. What do most of us call that? An accident. Right? But if I am really sensitive to, to changing myself, what would I actually do? I would go, okay, I have caused pain or suffering to somebody else. Just by being there, I've caused this pain and suffering. In Australia, I don't know what it's like here, but just being in an accident, you're 25% wrong. <laughs> just by being there. That, that's how they, they see it. So, so, so we've caused pain or suffering to somebody else. It hasn't been on purpose, but it obviously has a cause. We need to examine the cause. And the cause just isn't the ice on the road. Because the cause, if I was doing zero miles per hour with the ice on the road, Nothing would have happened with the ice on the road. If, if I was uh, just two seconds later crossing the ice on the road, the other car would have probably gone past me. And nothing would have happened. I would have slid across the other side of the road and missed them altogether. Perhaps. <coughs> it had to be right on that time, right on that day, right on that location. I had to make all of those choices that happened right up to that point. Did I not? for that accident to occur. If I was sensitive, very sensitive, I'd be going, okay, I'm causing pain or suffering to myself or another. The other person I definitely feel, I personally would probably feel terrible feeling of, oh, it's, you know, the, the terrible grief of having accidentally harmed somebody else is overwhelming, isn't it? When you let yourself feel it, and you probably feel that. But if you were truly honest with yourself, you'd go, what caused me to be in this location at that particular time, on that particular day, driving that particular speed, with that particular car, with that particular set of circumstances? There has to be some feelings inside of me that caused all those things. Does that make sense to everyone? And if I'm really sincere and I really love myself and I really love the other person, I will want to discover what those feelings were. Because I certainly wouldn't want to create another accident of a similar nature by not feeling those feelings. Now, I know some people, uh, one person in, in Australia that I know, she's had 16 or so accidents, right? Because she does not want to feel the feeling that keeps creating the accidents. Right? Now, that's definitely not being loving to herself, is it? She's keep creating accident after accident after <laughs> accident. And it's certainly not being loving to the people she has accidents with. Either by not by not facing the truth about it. So it seems to me that say I'm the person in the accident, I might not be an evil person to create the accident. I but agree. as soon as I deny the pain of it, I refuse to feel all my feelings of it. Now there's a way that I can commence evil, can't I? Yes. That this is the moment where the instant I go into deny. The pain and suffering within myself or in another person is the instant that I start acting in a more evil manner. In other words, yeah. I'm denying the pain in myself or others. Doing that automatically creates this circumstance where, where I'm creating 
uh, uh, feelings of anger in other people automatically. Because yes. you imagine if you had your whole family die in a car accident, you'd want the other driver to have at least some deal of remorse about being in the wrong place at the wrong time, wouldn't you? Otherwise, uh, if he goes around going, yeah, it's an accident, it just happened. If he had that attitude, how would you feel? You'd feel very angry, probably. So we, you can see that oftentimes we finish up creating anger in others by, by deterring from the pain we've created. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Any other ideas? <laughs> How do you love yourself? This is all about. <laughs> okay, I've got a lot of practice yeah. of learning to love myself. I got these ideas. <laughs> now go ahead. Um, maybe to um, to desire to grow and positively change. Uh, yes. Um, what have I put down here for that? Uh, what would it say that is? Desire to grow. More loving. Can I put? and truthful. And then I'll put in brackets, that's what I would view as positive change. Often I ask people what they view positive change would be, and oftentimes what they view positive change would be is uh, not the desire to grow more loving and truthful. <laughs> so we need to be a bit tighter with the definition. Yeah? Some people feel that they were positively changing, that have more things or, or, more power. or more power or whatever. So if I love myself, um, what else am I? Am I? What do I? What, what do I do with my belief systems if I love myself? Investigate. Really look at them. I look at them. Investigate them. Investigate them, but. Do I easily accept another person's belief systems? Would you just do, just sort of accept any belief system that come along if you loved yourself? No. No? What, what, you would make sure firstly that you investigated it first, wouldn't you, fully, and that you could accept it and all those kind of things if you loved yourself. But, but if you loved yourself, once you had a belief system, what would you feel about it? Protected? No. Not at all. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> we would feel comfort with it. We would actually feel, what I've written down here, is that I would be secure in my own belief systems. Can you see that? So, security in your own belief systems. Now, can you see how that relates to evil? So, when somebody challenges my belief systems... When somebody challenges my belief systems, how would I react if I feel secure about them? I wouldn't be angry, would I? Okay, okay. no worries. You want to believe that, that's fine. I'm, I'm still going to love you whether you want me to believe that or not. You'd be secure in your belief systems enough to not justify attacking the other person because they have a different belief system. Can you see that? So you see, a lot of times when, when evil actions are taken on the planet, particularly in justification of religious reasons or political reasons, it's because that each person is not really very secure of their own system. Of their own system. And whenever their own system is challenged, they automatically feel rage. And the reason why they feel rage is because underneath that, they're actually not feeling very secure about their own belief system. Now, if I love myself, I will have security in my own belief systems. I'm not saying, and what I've written here is, if I am not secure, I am relaxed if I have to change my belief systems. So, so rather than feeling uptight and angry with everyone else who does not have the same belief system as me, I am relaxed that I might have to change my belief system at some point in the future. And what I've said here is I never feel the need to force others to believe what I believe. Since I know that eventually either I or they will have to change their belief to become more loving. Right? 
Also, I realise that it's impossible to force a belief upon an unwilling person. Each person must exercise their own will to change their beliefs. Do you understand? So in all the discussions I'm giving, I'm trying to remind you that you have the right to hold on to your beliefs. Right? But you don't have the right to force them down somebody else's throat. That's an unloving action. <laughs> Do you understand? Now, many people who learn the divine love path start forcing down the belief on their partners. Do you understand? They start trying to force the partner to have the same belief. That is an unloving action. That is actually evil, as in order to our previous definition. Right? Of course you're not going to get a very good response. Yeah? So when we're secure in our own belief systems, we feel this sense of confidence, not that we have the right belief, but that we can easily change our beliefs if we're shown to be wrong at some point in the future. We don't feel any need to attack another person because of their beliefs. We don't need, feel the need to change them, to force them into doing something different. Does that make sense to everyone? So, so loving yourself, you will be secure in your own belief systems. Right? And if you're not secure, you won't feel challenged by the insecurity. You'll be relaxed about it. You'll go, yeah, no worries. I don't know. <laughs> Often, because I would say I'm Jesus, often people in the media come to me and they say, does that mean you know everything? And I go, no, I don't know everything. Now, they, their belief is that Jesus should know everything. Right? And they're okay, with, I'm okay with them having that belief. It's just not true. I'm Jesus and I know I don't know everything. <laughs> right? So, so they have this belief system that they're trying to force upon me, and they're really saying to me, I am not Jesus because I don't know everything. And I go, well, that's pretty logical. If I knew everything, I'd be God oh, and no. not Jesus. <laughs> right? I, I wouldn't be a work in progress. I'd be complete, complete. Not only that, if I knew everything, I'd definitely be God by that stage. I, I'd actually be God, not, not just a man. So, so when you're secure in your belief systems, you, are not, you don't feel challenged to admit that you don't know. It's a, it's a joy to admit you don't know. Right? Because it, it, then somebody might be able to share something with you that you might come to know <laughs> after that. But if you feel challenged every time you don't know, then you're going to react quite angrily to any challenge. Of your belief systems. Now, can you see security in your own beliefs? Most people on the planet don't have it. Because you just say something to them that's different to their own beliefs, and what's the first reaction? Anger. Anger. So they don't, they're not secure in their beliefs. Right? How many little children, like three year olds, go, Mummy, Daddy, does God exist? Amazing question, man. Most parents have no idea whether God exists. Right? They don't have any personal proof in their own life, many of them feel that they, but they have a belief system. So often, what the parent will say if they're in a Christian now, they go, Of course, God believes, God, God exists. Right? It would be far more powerful for them to say, I don't know, I think God exists, but I'm not sure. I've never had any personal experience of God, so I just hope God exists, <laughs> but I still don't know whether God actually exists. Now, a person who's secure in their own belief systems would say that, if that's what they felt. Right? And if somebody says to, if, if they were secure in their belief in God, they would say, yes, I know for certain God exists, and they'd be able to explain why they know for certain God exists. But then if somebody challenges them, they wouldn't get upset. And if somebody, like an atheist, come along and said, you're an idiot for thinking that God exists. No worries. I understand why you think that way. Uh, coming from the background that you do and so forth, I can see why you might feel that way too. But that's not what I believe. There would be no anger in response. There would be definitely no reason to resort to violence in response. Can you see that? 
Now, what about security in your own beliefs about yourself? Because that is also included. So if somebody comes up, you're a poofta. Is that a word here? <laughs> a gay man in, in, in Australia is often called a poofta. In a derogatory sense. How did you say that again? It's P double O F T E R. Poofta. Now, I don't believe that myself. Like, one of my best friends is the Apostle John, who's a gay man. So, so please don't feel that I feel that way about gay men. But I'm saying, if somebody came up to you as a gay man and called you a poofta, you wouldn't feel, if you were secure in your own belief, you would not feel challenged by that. And if somebody called you a gay person, even when you're not a gay person, you wouldn't feel challenged by that either. Does that make sense? Because inside yourself, you know who you are. You know what your attractions are. Right? And it was quite recently that I was called a poofta, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had your shirt on. <laughs> There's a funny story about that because um, we do have a friend who is gay, who's a guy, who sent you an email about that shirt. He'd found a picture of two gay men wearing that same shirt. There's a picture on the internet of two gay men wearing this shirt with their arms around each other. I can't remember when someone called you gay, babe. Yeah, in a recent email I got from a Christian lady. Oh, that's right. um, yeah. It, she was a Catholic Christian lady, and she emailed me and said that I was such a stupid idiot to believe on Jesus, and she went on for a bit. And I thought, yeah, it'd be good to reply to this email. So, so, what, I did, so what I did is I actually replied. I said, do you realise that you're actually in a rage with me? And you've just got so much anger coming out of you, even in this email towards me. And then the next email was a heap of swear words calling me a poofter. <laughs> and then I, and then I, so I emailed her back again. Right? And I said, if you didn't want to engage Jesus in a discussion, then why do you email him? <laughs> Surely. And she said, I never, she said, I don't, I didn't email you to get a response. <laughs> and I said, so I emailed her back. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, well, that's very logical for a start. But, but secondly, if you didn't email me to get a response, then what was your purpose? Your pur only purpose could be to dump your emotions on me and to dump your rage on me. And then I got out the, a Bible verse. Um, have I got a Bible here? Yes, yes. I've got out this Bible verse. Um, it's um, this one here, it says, You heard that it was said in, in, to those in ancient times, you must not murder, but whoever commits a murder will be accountable to the court of justice. However, I say to you, that everyone who continues wrathful with his brother will be accountable to the court of justice. That's my words in the first century where I was talking about anger and I was saying to people that God will actually account for your anger and rage. Every time you're angry and in a rage, God accounts for it. Right? You'll have to account for it at some point in your future, every time you're in a rage. Now, of course... She wasn't too impressed with that verse. <laughs> Considering it came from the Bible that she like, told me that I need to read because I'm obviously not Jesus. And, 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 so, and this is what I found in this interaction, is that the majority of people are in this evil cycle before they even realise it. They're in this cycle of evil before they realise it. And they don't even realise that a lot of the things they're quoting to me as to all this evidence and proof that I cannot be who I am and so forth, the Bible itself condemns their actions in the process. There's another one that says, you heard it was said, you must love your neighbour and hate your enemy. I quoted this to her as well. However, I say to you, continue to love your enemies and to pray for those persecuting you. So I suggested to her that rather than actually calling me a poofta with a lot of swear words associated, she'd be better off loving me and praying for me. 
which is what her Jesus said she should do. Huh? All I got back was another barrage of swearers. <laughs> so it didn't work very well. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the way it goes. But what I'm illustrating is if I'm, secure in, if I'm secure in my own beliefs, I wouldn't be swearing back at her and saying all these nasty things back at her. I would just be secure in the belief systems that I have. Does that make sense? Automatically secure. I won't be attacking the person, but I will be standing up for, as you said here, or this one here, truth. Telling the truth to ourselves and also to others about ourselves. I will stand up for what the truth is. But I won't, uh, I won't feel like I need to attack the person or denigrate them or, or make them feel small or little or bad about themselves. But I will state the truth. And that's the, that's the issue there. Okay. How are we going? We get some of those. We need to go through some of these as to what they'll do with evil, don't we? So let's say we start going through some of these as if we did this, how will it affect evil on the planet? And then I'll add some more to the list. So if I don't cater to my own addictions, demands and expectations, how does that actually negate evil on the planet? How does it do that? Um, you could not be manipulated or controlled. You, you personally then cannot be manipulated and controlled by your own addictions, yes. <laughs> Uh, you stop projecting your wounds onto other people. Right. You, start, you stop actually implying to other people that they are bad, wrong, whatever other things, because, because you're fully self-aware about your own addictions and so forth. And you certainly don't try to wound them with your addictions, yes? Anything else? I'll, 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 I'll say something. I see my addictions and demands upon others as an unloving and unjust action within myself. Therefore, I do not feel that others need to do anything I want or need. Others don't need to love me, look after me, make me feel good, make me feel anything at all, in fact. I feel responsible for myself rather than demand that other people take responsibility for me. Now, when I do all of those things, it's impossible for me then to have my addictions affecting somebody else. In other words, I am now in a place where I'm not demanding or expecting anyone in my environment to satisfy anything within myself. They don't even have to love me. In fact, I could be totally like not have a single other person who loves me on the planet, and I would still be. Happy. Which is an interesting concept, isn't it? Yeah. This is whether God's in my life or not. I have that capacity. You know, there are many six dimensional spirits, six sphere spirits, who are in this place where they don't have God, but they feel completely secure inside of themselves. Yeah. Sometimes erroneously so. Okay. So that covered, do you think? Can you see the effect that it'll have on evil? <coughs> Dramatically, a lot of things would change, wouldn't they? All right, let's look at the second one. Desire to feel all of my own emotions, even my own pain. How does that affect evil? How does that affect evil on the planet? Um, I would imagine it to be like a constant fluidity, so there's no block created, like it just bounces like off. Any sort of malevolent, malevolent intention and in, in evil would kind of just not like catch. Let's say, like, um, um, are you feeling like in terms of? I can only, I, I can like a. Uh, it's hard for me to. I can only describe it as like movement. Like when you're always feeling, it's like it's always in movement, sort yeah. of. Yeah. You're always fluid, and evil intentions or malevolent intentions to try to cause a block or. Yeah. And you don't allow that sort of. So it's like a. I don't know how to word it the I right way. I understand what you're saying, but let's yeah. be a little more specific, shall we, Katarina? Uh, I feel that evil will not be able to blackmail me then. 
No one be out of black value with your own emotions? With my emotions, oh, yeah, really? or my shame or my pain or my, my fear. So they can't threaten you? Right. Can they? Because you're willing to feel any pain, so they can't threaten you with pain. Right. You're willing to even die. So right. they can't threaten you with pain to, in order to make you do something. Right. Yeah? Or shame. Or shame. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times we'd rather die than feel shame. Right. <laughs> so that's, that's very true. Michael? If I'm feeling my emotions, I won't be projecting them and creating more evil. Okay, so I won't be uh, putting them upon my environment in any way. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Lawrence. I have the same answer. If I repress my emotions, they're going to come out in some kind of a destructive manner yep. towards myself or, or my others. environment. Yep. Yep. So it could be even towards yourself. Yep. Um, doesn't it also come down to being proactive rather than reactive? So that you take a, a personal... Um, uh, you, you take responsibility for everything you're feeling in that moment. Yes. That no matter what's being said to you, no matter what's coming in, your response is your response. Exactly. It's not being affected by anyone out here. It's only what, what, what your triggers are. Exactly. And, and that's usually past stuff that, that each person needs stuff, to, to work on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Always. Exactly. Yeah. It's very rarely the thing that's happening in the moment. Right. Yeah. I agree. Any other things you can think of? The benefits of feeling everything, even your own pain? how that affects evil on the planet. What I've written down is a few things. I, I will not want others to share my pain. This is a major problem on the planet. Many of you are still wanting to share your pain with other people. That's why we talk about, oh, this painful thing happened. Oh, how are you going with your emotions? Oh, mm -hmm. oh yes, okay, yeah, you had that happen, did you? Oh, okay, no worries, and it, you know, it makes us feel better. We want to share our pain most of the time because we've yet to fully feel our pain. That's the reality. We don't want others to validate our pain. In other words, we don't need somebody else to say, yeah, that was a pretty bad event before we have a cry. We feel the bad event and we have a cry. We don't need somebody else to tell us that it was bad and then we have a cry. Right? Many people I meet have a cry when they meet me because they do need somebody else to tell them it was bad before they'll cry. Right? We don't have a feeling to help me with my pain. In other words, we're not projecting outwards of us, you've got to make me feel better, you've got to make me feel happier. If you don't make me feel happier or better, now you deserve some of my rage and anger or whatever other emotions that you want to project at us. I don't have the desire to avenge my pain. So if I'm in this space where I feel all of my pain, I don't have the desire to avenge it all. I don't have the desire to take revenge because I'm feeling pain. I just feel my pain. I don't have a desire to reduce my pain. In other words, I don't even have a desire to take a headache tablet to reduce my pain. Interesting concept, is it not? <laughs> I notice here in, uh, in America that you have more ads of a certain nature than what we have on our television. <laughs> We watched a bit of telly the other, the other night. And, and you have a lot of ads about medical conditions. And it's very interesting, your ads. They all have big disclaimers. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have that in Australia. They, they don't have that because they're not afraid of the, lit, the litigation. That was forced yeah. upon them. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so now they all have these like, disclaimers on it. And, and when we watch those ads, we go, wow, this is a, it's almost an anti-ad for the ad. It's <laughs> so amazing. And, um, and the reality is, we will not seek, if we truly, if we truly do this, we will not seek temporary solutions for our pain. Right? Now, if you think about that, the majority of people on the planet in the Western society do this. So it gives you an indication of how addicted we are to not feel our pain, any physical pain in particular. But in emotional pain, um, what are the biggest selling drugs on the planet generally? Antidepressants. Antidepressants. Oh, wow. yeah. 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 Interesting. So, uh, aside from, of course, the headache tablets and stuff, I mean the ones that you have to go and get a prescription for. And also sleeping pills. Also sleeping pills, yes. Which is also an interesting way of avoiding pain. And I don't have a feeling to remove the fear of my pain. I don't have a feeling in me, when I love myself and I desire to feel all of my own emotions, even pain, 
I don't have a feeling that someone else should remove the fear of my pain. So when I'm afraid of my own pain, I don't go to somebody else and, and either get them to commiserate with me of how, about how bad this pain is, and I don't have the desire for them to remove the fear of my pain by going, you'll be all right, everything will be fine, it's not that bad. All those emotions, you see. They're all still me avoiding my pain. And all of those things I've just listed are all causes of evil. Interesting. <coughs> Mary, would you like to say? Um, just a question from spirits, really. Mm -hmm. uh, there we've got a lot of fear, mm -hmm. but their feelings are, OK, all that stops me being evil. <laughs> yes. They're willing to... Um, entertain that possibility mm -hmm. but then they say what stops somebody else being evil to me how can that help like if someone's coming to attack me how how can doing this or doing these things stop evil around me well firstly and this is a basic principle we all need to get and understand really deeply in our soul is that the reality is that no one around me is not going to be able to be evil unless I stop being evil. So in other words, no one around me can stop being evil unless I stop being evil first. Mm -hmm. This is a deep responsibility that I have to take. Yeah. If every single person on the planet took that responsibility and every single person in the spirit world took that responsibility, we would instantly be cured of all evil. Instantly. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that as a basic principle first that it's impossible for evil around me to change unless I stop being evil first. Yeah. So can I just comment a bit more about that and then I'll answer their question properly. Yeah. But does everyone understand that if, if I don't stop being evil first, then how can I expect my neighbour to stop being evil before me? It's not very fair, is it? to expect my neighbour to become perfect before I do is not a fair requirement upon my neighbour. To expect my partner to become loving before I do is not a loving expectation of my partner. To expect my child to be de demonstrate more loving development than I have is not a loving expectation of my child. We have all of these expectations. So, so the first thing we need to come to understand is that. The second thing we need to come to understand is they're only saying that because they're afraid of the evil of others. <coughs> when you feel the evil of others and let it pass through you, you automatically in the spirit world go to a different location where there are less evil people. On earth, when you feel the evil of others and let it pass through you without acting upon it, you automatically have a feeling of less pain when evil is perpetrated towards you. Because all pain is associated with the emotion of fear. Does everyone understand? This is a very basic thing we need to understand about the human body. That all pain we experience in the human body and particularly all pain associated with suffering, long-term pain, in the human body, is all about our fear. We are, have Our fear creates the pain. Now, I've actually been through personal experiences in my life, both in the first century and in this life, where I was in so much pain and agony, and then all of a sudden, a fear release, and I'm no longer in any pain, but in exactly the same situation. Now, many people experience this when they get injured, where they don't even feel any pain, and yet they sometimes have even horrific injuries. So something changed. They no longer have a fear of the pain, and that causes their, their injuries to be as if they're not there, even though the injury is quite present. present. Many uh, people who are on the battlefields experience this process where they accept that they're probably going to die and in that moment they automatically have less fear, no fear sometimes. And when they have no fear, they also automatically don't feel the pain of their own body anymore. 
even though their body is obviously in pain. Mm. Okay. So this is an understanding we need to grasp, is that all <coughs> pain is created by fear. All pain is created by fear. Now, they would like to ask you more. No, I think we, we just... It's the, it's, the, it's the thing of fear, not wanting to experience their fear, which justifies them then maintaining the fear of people, exactly. uh, saying that it can't, it's no trust. The instant and you feel your fear, you are no longer feeling pained by other people's no, evil no. either, no. which is very, very interesting yeah. as well. There's all these effects that it has. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, babe. Does everyone get that? Yeah. yeah? Is that a bit too deep, that one? Yes, <laughs> it <laughs> And my suggestion, if you don't believe me, is to try some experiments. One good experiment is to get a person who's into deep tissue massage. <laughs> Lay on the table... Get them to just deep tissue massage your legs. Mm -hmm. right? Most of us will go into quite high degrees of pain with a decent deep tissue massage of our legs. The reason why is we, we suppress a lot of our emotion as far away from feeling it as possible. Mm -hmm. And so our legs finish up getting quite a degree of those emotions stored in them. And when you get a deep tissue massage, if you allow the pain, allow yourself to allow the pain rather than try to get away from it. It's very difficult to do, by the way. And you might need multiple sessions before the experiment works. <laughs> you will actually find, once you allow it completely emotionally, and you no longer are afraid of the pain itself, you will find the pain will disappear. It will just go away. It will be like it's not there anymore. It'll just be, it'll be like a it's, a, it's a very interesting spiritual change <laughs> that happens in you because the, the belief inside of yourself just changes is about pain and your ability to experience it. It can also help you then accept your emotional pain as a result. Yeah. So, so um, if you don't, if you want to try that experiment, you, you will find that you'll reach this You'll reach this threshold of pain that's almost totally unbearable, and then once you deal with the belief about it, it'll disappear. And actually, the, deep, the same deep tissue massage will become pleasurable rather than painful. <coughs> but the problem is most people on the planet, when they get deep tissue massage, just spend most of their time screaming and, uh, <laughs> and, and don't allow that threshold to be reached. Yeah? Okay. Very important this one, isn't it? Can you see how important that one is for the er eradication of evil? This, this one here. And, and can I just read out the thing again because I feel that, that many of you might not have got some of these points. But I don't want others, if I do this, I don't want others to share my pain. In other words... I can feel the pain inside of me and I don't expect Michael to attempt to feel my pain in any way. I don't want him to share in it. I don't want to bombard him with it. I don't want to intellectually browbeat him with it. I don't want to nag him about it. I don't want to complain at him about it. It's my own pain and I own it. Doesn't that go under the heading of love for others? It does, but it's more under love of self because the reality Bubbles is, over from there. Yeah, but because when I feel all of my own emotions, including my Sorry. own pain, I am actually loving myself the most. Right? That, that's the time when I'm loving myself the most. Um, if one chooses or decides to go into fear or grief afterwards, um, how do we know that that's love? How does that? How is that defined, like, as a feeling or intangible experience? Every single time you choose to feel your own emotion, you are automatically not having or forcing somebody else to feel your emotion. Automatically, and that is automatically then an act of love for the other person as well, yeah, towards the other person. 
why, when I choose to feel my own pain and I allow that pain to surface and I feel it, I am now incapable of harming another person with that pain. So it's automatically an act of love. And I don't want others to share my pain, to validate my pain. You know what I mean by validating pain? You know, you, you get hyper, hypochondriacs generally do this really, really well. Yes. Oh, terrible pain today. Oh, it's just shocking how much pain I'm in today. It's my back hurts and my this hurts and my that hurts. And, you know, we have some poems actually that we've read um, in Australia, written hundreds of years ago, that talk about people like that who complain about everything all the time. And we don't want other people to do that. We don't want other people to share the pain that we have. We don't want them to help me with my pain, avenge my pain. And this is something for many women. We want our men to avenge our pain. So in other words, we can go, I'm nice and distant from the fact that I've just harmed somebody. My man did it for me. And he's a good man if he does it for me. That's what many women believe. Yeah? This has caused many wars, by the way, where the women are so afraid that they send their men off to war to protect them. Yeah? Historically, this has been the case. I don't want others to reduce my pain. And that gets back to that. Even I don't take substances to reduce my pain. I allow my pain to be felt. Now, of course, um, you need to, if you, if you aren't dealing with your pain, if you aren't choosing to feel it, then, of course, if you want to, reach for a substance. You have free will. I'm not saying don't do something that you desire to do. Right? I'm just saying that understand every single time I have the desire to remove my pain, I'm not loving myself. I'm not, and therefore, I'm potentially perpetrating things against other people because I'm not loving myself. Yeah? And don't remove the fear of your pain. So don't, don't get others to remove what you're afraid of to calm your fears. Because every time you try to calm your fears, you're just suppressing them again. They come up and then you suppress them, come up and suppress them. I'd say it seems like when I have a pain of some kind, it's calling my attention to a situation that needs to be corrected. I agree. Okay. <laughs> just bring it here, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just fix that. <laughs> There's a knack to this one. Just make sure it's doing. Yeah, it's everything's working. You're dead right. You're dead right. Every time you have pain, it always is pointing you in the direction of something to be correct. Always. Okay. So, do we get that one, Joy? Yeah. It um, uh, contradicts the Christian belief that Jesus died for me on the cross to save me from my sins. Exactly. That whole. Jesus died to save me from my pain. Mm. Nobody can die to save you from your pain. Mm. Nobody. Some Eat. people are a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> and then they can die. <laughs> and that'll save you from being pain. You know? But even, a, even if you find your pain by other people, it's always due to your own pain. Always. There's always something inside of self. And it could be just something like you're not willing to say to the person, actually, you're a very unloving person. Or, you know, just your fear of addressing their problem can cause your pain. So we've looked at that one and that one. Rub those off. Okay. How does telling the truth to ourselves and to others about ourselves help the world become a less evil place? It's the crux of the whole deal. Because without truth, you can't love yourself. I it's agree. impossible. But how does it work? Because when you thoroughly love yourself, your God's self, you see your God's self in everybody else. And so if I, if I love myself, my true self, my ongoing forever self, then I see that in everybody else. And so therefore, I want the best for them yeah. also. But how does that actually make less evil? Like Evil doesn't have a chance when you're... Evil, my belief, anyway, is that evil gets a toehold every time we feel an evil emotion towards somebody else. Every time you feel it or act upon it? 
feel it, feel it, or think it, because when I, if I feel it, then there's lots of those little spirits out there that are saying, oh, goody, let's get one going here. Yeah. And, but if you don't feel it, oh, guy's so boring, he just loves everything. You see? And so we're spreading love around, and if we don't have those evil feelings, this evil spirits are just going to die But let's say somebody does have them. the evil feeling, like the evil feeling is in them, let's say. So let's say in their childhood something happened that caused the evil feeling to enter them. What do they do with that? Fill it with love instead. In other words, when a person goes through their life looking around, oh, wow, that's beautiful. Oh, I really love that person. And oh, isn't this rug beautiful? There isn't room for a lot of hate feelings because you fill in all that dump with well, love feelings my and appreciation. Is completely different. Oh, my that could be. Is yeah. this. While the evil feeling resides within you, yeah, you will carry it around, and it will almost be very. It'll be very, very difficult to deny. For the evil feeling to get out of you, it has to be felt, but not acted upon. Oh, well, yeah, you always acknowledge, that's true. Yep. You acknowledge that it's there, but then I would say, well, I would much rather feel love. Yeah, but I'm not saying, see, what you're describing is what I call the natural love bath. A, a desire to change intellectually what's really happening emotionally. Oh, no, 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 no. Not at yes, all. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm saying it is. No, because if it's real, you feel it. No, but it can't be real unless you release the opposite emotion. This is what I'm saying. This is what I said right at the start. You just don't bother with it. You got too, you're too busy appreciating and feeling love for things to give it any energy. And it I just dies of neglect. I can't agree with you. You are automatically going to bother I'll bother. still love you. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you are automatic. I feel it's one of the major problems on the planet, this belief. And the reason why it's a major problem is because most religions... You don't understand what I'm saying. I am understanding completely what you're saying. <laughs> the reason why it's a major problem, this belief, is because it tells you that you can intellectually change something that is still emotionally within you. And I believe you cannot. And I agree with you. No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't, from what you just described. <laughs> well, then... You gotta hang up in the words somewhere along in there. <laughs> I don't think so. But but I know I, I believe that that we're still um, on the same track here. I Maybe I didn't so. use the words you like to, to no, describe no, no. it, but see, I believe you believe I am okay. on the same track, but yeah, I feel we're right. on quite different tracks. Okay. Can I explain? Now? Sure, go for it. <laughs> or attempt to. Thank you, discussion. Remember, right at the start, I said doing. It is not feeling it. Right. Feeling your evil emotion keeps it alive. Let it die of neglect. No, it's not feeling it that keeps it alive. It's acting upon it that keeps it alive and not feeling its underlying cause. You see, underneath every evil emotion, Underneath every evil emotion uh -huh. is the real cause. And I need to feel the real cause of every evil emotion. So, for example, let's say one of my evil emotions that I have is that I should be able to pay you back for anything that you do to me. Let's say I feel that. That I should be able to... If you attack me, I should be able to attack you back. Oh, okay. Let's say I believe that. Yeah. All right? Where does that evil emotion come from? It's got to come you from something. You tell me you got it, not me. Sorry? <laughs> what was that? What was that? I said, you tell me you got it, not me. <laughs> well, I'd call that sarcasm, but anyway. <laughs> and I was asking where you feel it's coming from. Like, if, 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 there, if I have a feeling in me yeah. that, that I want to attack you, yeah. if you attack me, then that belief has to have entered me somewhere. You understand? Yeah? Sure. And it's entered me as an emotion, because as soon as you attack me, I attack you back. You see little children doing this, right? Yeah. That's three years old, little children hits one of the other, what does the other one do straight away? Whack them back, yeah. and then, you know, the other one whacks them, and the, the person that whacks mm -hmm. the hardest wins. Right? 
and when we grow up to be adults, what we do instead is, right, you get out, you know, you get out your fist and punch me, I get out a knife and stab you, you get out your machine gun and shoot at me, and I get out my bazooka, and then you get out your atomic bomb, right? And that's how it works as adults, generally. It's the same emotion, which is this belief that I can attack you if you attack me. Now, for that to disappear, yeah. I, I can't try to do something different. I have to actually change something in my heart that causes me to automatically do something different. So I've got to find the reason inside of me why this feeling exists. And the only way I can find that is by feeling them without actually looking at them here. Now, almost every person I've met on the natural love path in the spirit world, and I've met millions of them, as you can imagine, they have over and over said to me that they can try to feel something against their own feelings. And many of them reach the sixth dimension of the spirit world doing what you suggest. But they don't go any further. Because unless you actually feel it and release the unlying cause, you cannot actually make a real change greater than that location. So while that location is a very pleasant location, and we'd certainly, if everyone on the earth did exactly what you said, everyone on the earth would end up in a better space. I agree with that. I can't agree that that's the best solution. The best solution is to actually release from myself all of the causes why I believe I can attack you. To do that, I'm going to have to feel them. I'm going to have to feel about each one of them, to actually feel my way through them and actually feel what the underlying reason is. And it can get down to very basic things when I do that. It could get back down to the fact that when I was young, every time my brother hit me, my parents stepped in and didn't let me hit him back. Right? It could be just a simple thing like that. I felt injustice, injustice at not being able to hit back. And so what I did was I decided that the true justice is to be able to hit back. Yeah. But I did just get extremely good at whacking back. Sorry? And then I had no need to do it anymore. Yeah, but see... What I would suggest is when you feel the reason why you were extremely good at whacking back, you would actually not do it anymore and never have a desire to do it anymore. Whereas right at the moment, the emotion is still within you. Right at the moment. And it, can, it cannot be anything other until it's released. Until it's emotionally released. The reason for it is released. Well, maybe in dealing with it in the way that I did, which was uh, taking up wrestling and boxing and all that sort of thing, that, exactly. um, yeah, you know, that um, I no longer, and I did have what you're saying, you know, because my, my older brother used to push me around a lot. Yep. And then after I got dump, done dumping him on his head a few times, then I didn't feel a need to do that anymore. So I worked my way through it. I just didn't, just didn't need it anymore. Yeah. But I'm saying the actual cause as to why you dumped your brother on the head is yet to be released. The actual emotional reason why. And that's what drew you to things like boxing and wrestling and other things like that. It's the actual emotion that drew you there. And when that Well, okay, it drew me there, but it, you know, I worked through it. And what I'm suggesting is that you haven't worked through it. <laughs> that's what I'm suggesting. You don't have to believe in it. But that's yeah, 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 you're being judgmental. <laughs> um, no, I'm actually telling you the truth. <laughs> but you can feel I'm judgmental. <laughs> That's sweet of you. Yes. The, uh, just in in listening to that discussion, it one of the things that I investigated in, in after connecting with your video sessions in July was the threads of um, error in all of the natural love paths mm -hmm. that, you know, and one of the biggest things was the smoothing over of emotions. Yes, it is, it is a greatly uh, ineffective very. way. And what it. happens is it's smoothing over those emotions, and meditation is one of the biggest ones that's smoothing mm -hmm. over emotions. Yep. And the whole idea of just just being love, everything's love, it's like it's smoothing over and you're not like, you're getting, the owning feelings. the real deep 
ones that began that whole string of things. I agree. And that is the piece that I can feel he's relating, because I can feel from you that place of that smoothing over the emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, love, if I've just, if I just be love, but yet you can't be true love until it's like a feeling rising, yeah. you know, all that stuff rising. Spot on. It, it, tr true love has to come from the heart, and, it, and, it, and, it's, and, and the problem is, is it's coming through many unhealed emotions for many people. So while they do, they are acting in a loving manner, the emotions coming from them aren't always loving. So coming from yourself quite frequently is a very strong demand that you're heard, for example. Right? This is one reason why you yell out in the middle of a group. No, I just get excited about the subject. I just really jazz. I'm, yeah, and you bring out a lot of excitement in you know, Oh, goody, you know, this is really the stuff I like to get in, involved no, in. So. You're ever heard about it. Huh? Is it demand, like, there's other people that are totally excited, but they don't yell out. Oh, I know, but I just... So this, what I'm saying is that there's this emotion... I like to honestly express myself. But I don't feel you're honestly expressing yourself. You're oh. in an addiction to be heard, right? And it, and the rest of the group feel it as an addiction. They feel it as an imposition upon them. Okay, I'll shut up. No, no, I'm not asking you to shut up. I'm asking you to look at the imposition. Does that make sense? I'm asking you to look at the imposition upon the rest of the group. Does that make sense? Because when, when you speak up like you do without, like, without there being, like... Or just automatically without there being a question, uh, a question asked or you being asked, then what happens is there's an imposition on the rest of the group that they actually listen to your voice in that moment and they might not like, want to. And some of them, I can feel, don't want to actually. Yeah. And, but, but the key is to feel the imposition. Like what, where does the imposition come from? And this is what I'm saying is we can try to be loving, but until we feel what the cause of that is, we can't be loving. It'll be an automatic action until we feel the cause. And when, when the cause goes away, we automatically are different. So um, in one of my groups in Sweden, this was illustrated. Um, I'd like to uh, formally apologize to you and to the rest of the group for my uh, bubbling over too much. Oh, I don't feel you're bubbling. I like your bubbling over. Yeah. <laughs> the bubbling over is not the feeling that I'm talking about. Okay. Oh, I love that. That's beautiful in you. Mm -hmm. And so please don't change that. <laughs> That's the enthusiasm, desire, and all those things that come out. There is this other thing of needing to be heard, needing to have your opinion heard by a group of people. That's the thing I'm speaking about. Does that make sense? And it's a different feeling that comes from you when you do that. When you're in your desire, it's a lovely feeling coming from you. It's a really passionate, childlike, and, and spontaneous feeling, and it's really quite, quite lovely. When you're in the other place, it feels like a, an addiction. It feels like a demand being placed, and that's the, the one I'm speaking of. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Love you. I'll, I'll sit yeah. to that. Yeah. So, so allow, allow yourself, and this is a suggestion I have to everyone, is allow others to discover yourself through others and what they feel from you too. You know, like, so so what, what I've done a lot of my life is I've noticed other people's response to me. I say, well, why do you respond like that to me? What, what, what is coming out of me that causes you to react the way you do towards myself? Like, what, what is it that you're feeling? And I've discovered a lot of things about myself by doing that, by, by asking other people what the response is and so forth. So anyway, getting back on the subject, if we can do that. So we were talking about telling the truth to ourselves and to others about ourselves. How does that make us more loving and how does that stop evil? Um, so I, I actually have a question about the one you erased before, if it's okay to ask it now. Which one was that? The one about the pain. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and the physical pain and things like that. Um, being associated with um, untruths or emotions that aren't being, that you're not feeling. Um, and I was thinking, how would a person be able to, like let's say like a fear of needles or something like that, where where would, how would they like dig to find the emotion of like the root pain of that? Um, so fear of needles, that's true, I've had that. I used to, when I get a needle, I'd get <laughs> <laughs> 
So, and that one's not so good, so let's just that one out. This one's better. Okay, so we've got that one. Yeah, that one's not so good. Let's put them all in one bracket, fears of physical pain. Okay. When I um, used to have an evil, if I give that as an example, I used to have my tummy just went into this huge, sickening knot where I felt like I was almost going to vomit. And then shortly after that, if, if, I, if I didn't allow myself to feel that feeling, I would pass out. Like I'd faint. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, chunk. And now, um, and then I'd wake up, you know, obviously a few minutes later, <laughs> usually with a bump. Uh, and, 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 and then obviously have some additional pains as a result of that. But what I found was that it was very much associated with my childhood. Now, when I say what I found was, I didn't find it by thinking about it. What I did was I, was I allowed myself to reconnect with the feeling in my stomach that would happen every time I thought of a needle going into my arm or into my vein. You understand? Um, I would have made a terrible junkie. Because <laughs> I wouldn't even be able to cope with it. I wasn't, wouldn't be able to cope with it. And, and so what I would do is I'd just imagine myself now, using my imagination, just imagine myself with a needle coming into my vein and allow myself to feel inside of myself the memories that would come up as a result of that feeling. Does that make sense? So there were memories that started to get triggered. And I, for the first time, I remembered when I was 12 years of age, I had this huge cyst in my groin and the doctor got this needle which looked more like a... Uh, it looked like a big rod with a tube in it and stuck it into it and sucked all the stuff out oh, while I was screaming and being held down by two people. That was one of the events <laughs> that happened when I was 12, right? And then as I allowed myself to feel this sick feeling in my stomach, other memories started coming up right the way back to feelings that of, of... And what it ended up being is a feeling about my mother, actually that she allowed me to have these injections which I felt were painful. She, caused, she thought she was being loving at the time and all I felt was pain. And not only felt pain, but I actually felt her lack of love in the process, her fear in the process. Right? And what I finished up doing was associating um, that after feeling the way through all of those things, I had a lot of grief about how mum had treated me when I was young because she was afraid. She did a whole series of things to me, to me and my body just because of her fear. Right? And once I release all of that, I can now watch, even on television, or watch in real life somebody opening somebody up and delving inside of the body and everything without feeling <laughs> over, right? Before I couldn't even do that either. And, uh, and so I found the linkage, if you like, to those particular things was through through feeling, the feeling first, and then going back in time. And I didn't try to go back in time, it just happened naturally as I felt each event, where my mother, my mother was involved in every one of those events, taking me to a doctor, sometimes for what she viewed as a preventative thing, and other times for what she viewed as a non-preventative thing. So, and uh, I've, I've had been bitten by two dogs in my life, when I both happened when I was under the age of seven. And so I also had tetanus injections and so forth for those. And then like, there was this whole series of events, all associated with needles and my mum's fear. There was a link between my mum's fear and the event, every single time. Right? My mum, and so what I realised was that, and once I started grieving my mum's fear and its imposition upon me, I started realising the linkage of all of, a lot of my responses to physical pain were to do with my mum actually dis, dis, actually making a choice to create my physical pain so that her fear would go away. And a lot of our injections and inoculations and so forth are all about that. Yeah. And so once I released a lot of that, and I don't know if I've yet released them all, because even talking about it sometimes I get a bit of a twinge still in my stomach, so there's obviously some more things to do. Once I released a lot of that, I started having less fear of physical pain as a result. 
Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thanks. So the, the key is to go through the process rather than trying to skip over the process. Once you once you connect to the process, you remember all sorts of things you just shut down before then. Yeah. yeah. I have a question. If Oh, so hi. Um, <laughs> if you're the mother in that situation and your 12-year-old child has this cyst that's becoming very painful and and perhaps is life-threatening and they don't understand that some something you know that there is something that can can fix it, what what is loving in that situation? What's your role in in parenting? Well, we'll firstly look at what's loving and then we'll uh, we'll answer what would I do. <laughs> If, if the mother was actually loving and the father was actually loving, they'd realise that all disease in my child has an emotional cause within me. Now, if you really realise that, um, and you, you, you had some respect for that, you would actually have a very high diligence of releasing your own emotional injuries. And so, by the time the person's 12, they would probably never get a cyst in their groin, because the mother had done, and the father had done a lot of emotional work to release their emotional injuries that would have caused such a thing. Unfortunately, with our society today, we don't do that. So. We, we, every time we see a child with a problem, we want to fix it with a medical solution and we don't want to address any emotion within ourselves, generally. So we have to admit that as a parent. We have to go to ourselves, okay, the reality is, I know there's an emotional cause, but be blowed if I can access it or be blowed if I want to, right? Now, if that is the case, we need to understand that what, what we're doing is we are creating the child's pain. And a person who truly loved their child would not be taking such an action. Right. Can you see that? Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but what if the cyst is like, you've got three days before it goes toxic? Well, why did you, you know? get that bad? I, I, I know that's something that you've got to ask, but in the next three days, you've got to either release the emotion or they're going to be dead. I What's agree. loving in that situation? So under those circumstances, yeah. I would definitely take some medical action, right? Where I can see, I wouldn't leave it even that long. Generally, I wouldn't leave it to the child's in extreme agony before I took some medical yeah. action. But I would be saying to myself, my child's in extreme pain, or my child's going towards pain here, and it's because of my mm -hmm. denial of something mm -hmm. within me. Mm -hmm. And I would be definitely doing that as a part of the process. Does that make sense? Uh -huh, but what if then that child is afraid of needles? How would you, how would you handle the situation where they I'd weren't fear, I'd feel about, accepting. I was the parent, how I'd fought needles upon them in the past so many times because I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. And when I do that, I'll go through some repentance. And when I do that, my child will no longer be afraid of the needles anymore. Do you see? Yeah, so, yeah. so there'll be an automatic response there in the child as well. Yeah. And babe, isn't the thing that causes the most distress for our children in situations where they're in when they're unwell or whatever is the lack of love coming from the parent so yeah. the one thing I could do is to own my fear or release my fear when I'm with my sick child so that they still feel a steady stream of love coming yes. from me when yeah. you become afraid for your child's welfare your child is feeling less love from you not more love mm -hmm. you, do you get that mm -hmm. in fact the fear in the parent is the primary cause of with the withdrawal of love from children. Every single time as a parent you go into fear, you, it is the primary reason why your child does not feel loved by you. Every single time. And so if we understand this relationship between when I'm in fear, nobody around me can feel my love. But when, Mar when Mary went into fear yesterday, did you feel loved by her anymore? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no? You could see her fear and she was in a fear. So eventually she connected to it and went into her body with it and then you could start to feel some love again from her. But while she was acting upon the fear, can't, you can't feel it. And it's exactly the same and even more so with your children. Your children are far more sensitive to your fear than you are. So every single time you go into fear, they see it as a withdrawal of love. 
they feel it as a withdrawal of love. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And, and therefore, every single time you're afraid... So if you're sitting next to your child while he's getting an injection, your fear of the needle or your fear of his condition is having a bigger effect upon him or her than the needle. Mm-hmm. You understand? Yeah. And the child associates inside of themselves the needle with the fear which creates the feeling of sickness and all those other feelings that I mentioned earlier. If my mum had sat with me, no fear, and I was getting a needle, I would not even worry about the needle at all uh, because I wouldn't feel the withdrawal of love. Mm -hmm. But when she's in fear, now I'm feeling the withdrawal of love associated with this event. Now there's a tie-up between the two events, the needle itself and the withdrawal of love which automatically creates this feeling of sickness and so forth within. I have have one more question. Sure. It's about this, but if it goes off topic, just I'll ask you later. Yep. Do you ever have like a a, um, situation where like the grandmother has a disease and and then it skips over one generation and then the the child, the grandchild has like intergenerational diseases? What, What do you think about... Intergenerational um, diseases are, are meaning that are like skipping people. So are like, almost always the result of spirit overcloaking. Okay. Um, if I can illustrate, let's say grandma dies of cancer, uh, and she has a grown daughter who then has a child, a daughter or a son as a child. If grandma becomes earthbound and connects to that child, the child will either get leukemia or adult cancer. Well, I'm saying more like, um, like I have one of my children has like um, AD, ADD, and my mother has ADD. I don't have ADD, but some of my, my siblings have ADD. And so I'm thinking, how is that a part of my law of attraction? Uh, Can of, I make a strong comment about yeah. ADD? It make is not a, a disease. Strong. Okay. It's all to do with spirit overclock. Really? Yeah. It's all to do with how sensitive the person is to influence from spirits. It's not actually a disease at all. Schizophrenia, by the way, is not a disease either. Right? Manic depression is not a disease. Right? None of these things are diseases. They are all the result of spirit interaction. Yeah. Now I can explain that perhaps in a later question when we ask some personal questions or something like that. First of all, I want to apologize for the few times I've just spoken something out. That's okay. I want to apologize to all of you. Whenever we have that desire to do that, a lot of times there are some hidden emotions in it, so it's good to be aware of those emotions. That's the only reason why I raise it. Um, But about physical pain in the body, um, teeth and uh, you know, dental problems and stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm assuming there are emotional Always. reasons for that, yep. but when it gets to the stage where there are cavities and the dentist, yep. and it looks like a good idea to drill for them, yep. um, I have a lot of fear of the pain of uh, drilling. But Which is one reason why you have cavities. Of course. Yeah. No, I, so, but the question <laughs> is... It's not exactly like deep tissue massage. I mean, if somebody's drilling, I'm, I'm going to try not having anesthetic. And Remember I said, though, the fear of the pain oh, it's huge. is often related to your child yeah. when your parent was afraid. Parents was afraid. The parental fear. This is the same with many of our problems that we face in our body and many of the problems we face with what we call our allergies and other types of problems. They very rarely have anything to do with our own body being at fault. Uh, asthma, another, another issue. They have a lot to do with our parent, parental fear, the fear inside of our parents associated with different events that causes an association emotionally inside of ourselves when we're very young that create a disease or an illness of some kind. And the fear, like, so, so for example, teeth. 
How did your parents respond when you got a cavity? Well, my father's best friend was a dentist. Yes. So we went immediately to the dentist. Right. Um, and but how did they respond financially and all these other ways? The problem is that he didn't have to pay for it because our dentist was the best friend. I mean, as far as I know, it was like, oh, you're going to go see Dr. Hansen. And, right. and, but I don't remember... So what does your father have feel about not having to pay for things? Mm. See, see, if I had a best friend who was a dentist, I wouldn't go along the dentist expecting that I don't pay him. So your father obviously... Right, but he was uh, my dentist's lawyer, so it was, you know, he did, <laughs> he did the law, and my, my father's best friend did the dentistry, but um, all I can remember from my dad was he didn't want to have uh, an anesthetic, so he would tough it out, and he used to tell us we, he wanted us to do that too. But okay, so now we've happened. got an association of a, an emotion from your father. Why did he want you to tough it out? Because, um, I don't know, pain is good. <laughs> no. Interesting idea. Sto a stoic kind of idea. Stoicness mm -hmm. inside of him, yes. Yeah. A lot of parents have this uh, stoicness that causes desensitization inside of the child. So a lot of times we feel so much grief as a child associated with event because what's getting imposed upon us is this terrible feeling that, that we've got to do things exactly the way Dad and Mum did them, and we've got to be stoic about every feeling, we've got to not show any emotion, we've got oh, to no. sh not show any pain, and, <coughs> and these kind of events are the things to look at as to what causes your teeth issues. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And now, Mary does have teeth issues too, by the way, but Mary has found that there are some different emotions for her associated with the teeth issues than what, than what yours would be. The, the reality is that there will be different emotions for every person with teeth issues because in their childhood there will be different responses in their parents to them having a cavity. Does that make sense? And in Mary's case, you, well, do you want to mention what it is for your case? Or you... uh, yep, so dentists are expensive and um, we could never afford the dentist and also my mum had a real thing about fluoride um, and so she was almost angry at dentists because they use fluoride and she's it's a poison and she's right it is poison but um, she was very um, anti <laughs> us going to the dentist and then when we needed to go to the dentist it was always too expensive so money was more important than my comfort than my safe it's a safety feeling and I feel really there's also other feelings about being in the dentist chair and being out of control of my body so there's quite a few issues for me um, that all culminate in me having bad teeth <laughs> so can you see though the association for Mary is much about her mum in particular yeah. and her mother's emotions and when I feel about the issue it always brings me to mum like there's just this real link between mum's emotions and my feelings about my teeth and, yeah, yeah. So, so for every person who has teeth problems, there's going to be a different set of emotions associated with the creator. And once we deal with that set of emotions, our teeth have the ability to restore. And in fact, what Mary's been experimenting with on our trip was before she came away, there was a strong feeling Mary had that she was going to have to have a tooth ripped out or root canal. Root canal. Right? No, the dentist told me that. Yeah. And um, I was in a lot of pain. <laughs> and um, it was a very pivotal decision in my life actually because to me I, I'm quite stoic about pain in the rest of my body but in my mouth it's it's a dra drama <laughs> and uh, I made the decision not to honour my fear and that I was going to try and deal with the emotions and since I've done that 90% of the pain has actually gone out from my tooth but it's not right <laughs> because also it was inconclusive on the x-ray she said there's no cavity because there's no cavity in my tooth because now I'm fastidious about my teeth um, but the, the, it seems like the nerve is dying but it's not dead and I went right thank you God this is about me dealing with these emotions and um, so it was but it was very hard to cancel the dentist appointment to not get the root canal I was terrified and so far, I mean, I've accessed some of those emotions that we were talking about, but uh, I'm sure there's more. Yeah. 
So it's the same thing for me. I, uh, my dentist said either take the tooth out or root canal. Which side of your body is it? Right side, on the lower dad side. Um, so it's dad, your dad. <laughs> so, <laughs> so mom. Um, so I hadn't thought of it in terms of doing the emotional work on it, and now I will. I've been um, just using Ayurveda to, you know, herbs and stuff. But this is very good because now I can uh, work on the and emotional. And understand side. that when we cure the effect, when we try to deal with the effect, while we may get the release of pain, the emotion that created the pain is still within us. And we need to do, like I feel in most cases, we need to do both things. We need to nurse the effect and deal with the cause. Do you understand? And I feel the problem with most medicine is that it, is it nurses the effect without addressing the cause. And the problem with that is that the cause will still be present within the human body and cre continue to create the effects that it creates as a result. If we can address the underlying cause, then uh, we are not only automatically being more loving to ourselves, which is dealing with the emotion, but we are also being automatically more loving to everyone else <coughs> around us because, because we're not needing people to provide things to soothe the effect. And, uh, and unfortunately, there are huge industries at the moment created on the planet which are all about just soothing effects because we want to avoid causes. I gave a talk recently, uh, it was only a few months ago now, wasn't it, about the law of cause and effect. And there is actually a law that God's created called the law of cause and effect. And the, and the law basically states that if we do not address the cause, the effect will continue to be created and we'll have to make laws to address the effect. And in fact, this is why uh, highly evolved Western societies, we think we're highly evolved, we have m millions of laws. Many of you would not know how many laws you have in America. Is that not true? No. And the reason why we create all these laws is because we are so intent on trying to address the effect rather than addressing the cause. Once the law of love actually reigns supreme, you'll find we won't need any other law. You won't need a law saying what speed you should drive along the highway because the law of love in the part, heart of the person will go, right, it's a bit dangerous today, I'm going to slow right down. Tomorrow there's no one on the road, you know, it's, it's Sunday morning, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock Sunday morning, no one on the road for as far as the eye can see and I don't feel like it's dangerous at all, nice and clear road and everything, I can speed up. The law of love would automatically govern my actions without there needing to be a law that, causes, that, that addresses the effect. Also, if you examine a lot of uh, mankind's laws, you'll find that a lot of the laws are for specific problems or people. People that are problems. Right? So in other words, uh, we, how, many, how much of the population um, thieves at the moment? Do you have any idea? Is it like in the 10% range, do you think? Maybe more. Maybe more. I don't. I don't know what it is in the ones who are caught. Or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's a difference there. But let's say it's the ones that are caught. Basically, all the laws about thieving are just made for those people. Can you see that? Because if uh, if all the other people are not thieving, then there's a higher likelihood they don't have the injury that causes them to thieve, be a thief, and therefore they don't need the law. Right? You only need the law if you actually do the thing that, that, that is negative or, or wrong. You know, it's really, and this is the greatest gift I think that I ever got from anywhere, was you guys said, <laughs> I'm sorry. No rules, mate, just do what's right. <laughs> yeah. And it is so beautiful. Yeah. If everybody would live by that, it would be a totally different world. It's and fun. I imagine, all these, I saw that, heard that so many times in Australia, and I think these people must really be awesome because here in the United States, remember all those laws you were talking about? Everybody's trying to figure out how to get around the laws. Yeah. But if you just say, just do what's right, you're always going in your soul to figure out what's the right thing. Yeah. Because there's no rule that applies to everything at all times. Yeah, I agree. But your soul always knows what's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I feel that that's the main problem, is that, is that what we're doing is we're trying to, we make a lot of war, laws to address the people who don't do what's right, 
and and yet the majority of the population in any population who's who's in a peaceful condition generally wants to do what's right <laughs> and so so really we're making a whole set of rules for all the people who just want to do what's wrong <laughs> rather than addressing why they want to do what's wrong right so so this is part of the problem that we face and a lot of this stuff comes from our parents and so the, the issue that you raised earlier about parents and the parents emotions are very very important because a lot of times it is the suppression of emotion in the parent that creates these relationships between fear and pain. And once a relationship within us is created between those two things, fear and pain, we then take action based upon preventing pain or preventing fear. And every action we take trying to prevent pain or fear is always going to be unloving to ourselves or somebody else. That's how it generally works. Well, how are we going, Thomas? I've been talking to you about that. Yeah, no worries. It's probably time to have another break, and this time maybe have lunch, don't you think? Most of your tummies, tummies are rumbling there. And so what if we, uh, what is the time now? 1.48. Quarter to two. Quarter to already. Um, so why don't we, we'll have to finish this discussion there, I feel, and I'll continue it somewhere in Australia probably, so you have to get the continuation <laughs> <of> the <laughs> somewhere else. Because what I'd love to be able to do after our lunch period is to address some of the personal issues and problems or different things you would like to personally raise and and have more of a bit more of a discussion with you about those particular things if that if, if that's where you'd like to go is everyone okay with that yeah. yep so um, shall we say return about 2.30 does that give everyone enough time to have some of these and do you think yeah no worries let's do that